Well, welcome everybody. Apologies for being a, a couple of minutes late. Um, it's uh, with a lot of pleasure that uh, the Health Economics and Health Systems um, group at the Kirby are bringing today uh, some of our first presentations in this series, this webinar series. My name is Virginia Wiseman. Uh, I am a professor of health economics and health systems research at the Kirby Institute and also at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. And I'd like to begin by first acknowledging uh, the traditional owners of the land where I'm joining you today, and that is the Gadigal people of the Aura Nation. Um, I'd like to pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging, and also to um, welcome any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining us today. Um, so it's, uh, we're lucky enough to have two presentations today. Um, our first speaker is Richard Gray. Richard is a senior lecturer in the Surveillance and Evaluation Research Program at the Kirby Institute, also known as SERP. Um, and uh, Richard is our um, go-to mathematical modeler. We're very lucky to have him. Um, and I might hand over to you, Richard, now um, to uh, present uh, the title of your presentation today. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Um, nice to uh, be speaking to you today uh, as part of this uh, celebration of health economics and health systems research at the Kirby Institute. Um, today, I'm going to be talking about uh, modeling work I, I did actually a fair while ago, in some sense on the cost effectiveness of pre-exposure prophylaxis for HIV uh, in Australian gay men. Um, I guess uh, it's quite a quick talk today and I will be giving a, a fairly broad overview and um, probably not going uh, too, into too much detail. Always happy to talk about details around modeling and, and calculations and cost effectiveness. Uh, and I guess, uh, I wasn't sure about the audience today. So I'm going to give a bit of an introduction, which will be a bit of a yawn uh, for some people, especially those in the HIV sector, but I thought some people might not be in, familiar with HIV and the interventions for HIV. And there might be some health economists, uh, card carrying health economists joining us today. Uh, and then I just wanted to talk a little bit about how we would go about assessing uh, cost effectiveness for uh, HIV prep and then talk about some old news, which is work I done a few years ago uh, as part of some modeling uh, that went to the Pharmaceutical uh, Benefits Advisory Committee. And then I've actually managed to do some updates on those results, which I guess is actual news, but somewhat preliminary. So like I said, this, this slide here is probably gonna be a yawn to many of you, and it's just giving a very brief rundown of uh, what HIV uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis is, you know, simply it's for people who don't have HIV, uh, take drugs, or take uh, antiretroviral drugs that are used for treatment of HIV and to prevent them becoming infected. Um, and I guess when I'm saying PrEP here, I'm going to be a bit loose, but I've got the sort of uh, a formal definition of the, of the drugs and what it means. So it's a single dose uh, regimen of antiretroviral drugs that's taken orally uh, and it should generally be taken daily, but that's not necessarily always the case. But if it is taken daily uh, and in, within gain bisexual men and other men who have sex with men, it is, has a very high efficacy and it's very protective, even if uh, condoms and other prevention strategies aren't used. Um, and this efficacy can remain high, even if there's a bit of um, lack of adherence uh, though, it, you know, uh, and implementation studies, you know, have shown as PrEP has been very effective and I've just, there's, there's many, many studies uh, out there and I've just highlighted one that's uh, from uh, our colleagues at the Kirby that was published uh, just last month uh, from the uh, EPIC New South Wales implementation study. But I guess my aim of the talk here is to think about is PrEP uh, scale up and rolling it out to gay and bisexual men in Australia cost-effective implementation. And so for the health economists, this is the yawn for the health econo economists. So, you know, what do we mean by being PrEP being cost-effective is, you know, we want to work out do the benefits of scaling up PrEP among gay men outweigh all of the costs of providing it 
or could we actually use the money elsewhere and achieve, achieve more or do something else and achieve more so get more bang for our buck? When we're doing uh, this type of analysis, I guess there's lots of things to consider and it's very hard to consider everything. Uh, and usually there's some assumptions or uh, sort of restrictions on the, on the um, scope of the work taken into account. But, you know, we need to think of, you know, who is going to be taking it and how it's taken, um, you know, how does it fit in with other interventions that are already in place or being proposed to go in place? You know, how does introducing a new intervention change behaviours that are around sexual behaviour, for instance, and, you know, does it uh, lead to things like risk compensation uh, or, or an overall uh, less concern about HIV? And then of course, we've got many, many types of costs, you know, just around the rolling out and how it gets implemented and how the service is uh, integrated into the system and what do we need to introduce it. And then there's many things around monitoring people who are taking the intervention or taking PrEP and, you know, the care for uh, any, I guess, sort of side effects, I suppose. Uh, and then there's also, you maybe want to consider the individual's costs. So, you know, traveling time, uh, time to uh, time it takes to get prep. And I guess also finally, there's other things like how does it affect people's quality of life and how does it uh, change what they can contribute to society? So can, what's the pos some of the positive sides of things from them um, taking prep and um, the implementation process? So there's many things to uh, consider, uh, and I guess we can't consider everything, and some things are very hard to do, but when we're assessing uh, this type of intervention, I guess the approach is generally uh, for PrEP is to use mathematical models of population level HIV transmission. And the, and the purpose of these models is to try and bring in all of the data around the demographics, epi uh, epidemiological data, behavioral data, clinical and testing data and things like that together. So we can have a, a good sense and a picture of uh, the benefits and the costs associated with the intervention. So for such a model, we'd want to have all the population groups. You wanna have all the other interventions, like I said before, we wanna try and capture the aspects of the sexual behavior that's occurring and things around how people visit clinics and get tested for HIV and take treatment and things like that. And you know, once we have a model, then we can start doing simulations uh, and look at what happens if we have a theoretical scenario where we introduce PrEP, we see how many people get infected and how many people do we need to provide care and treatment for and how that changes over time. And you know, at the end of the day, we want to compare what happens if we introduce uh, PrEP versus if we didn't bother introducing PrEP and we just left things sort of going on as they were. So, so one thing to think about with infectious disease, I guess, cost effectiveness analyses is, is you know, why do we need a transition transmission model? And I guess, you know, everyone's sort of got the idea of chains of transmission and, and getting R less than one and things like that in the current environment, but you know. I guess the sim simply here is the basic concept is that with a transition model, by preventing an infection, you prevent a lot of potentially prevent a lot of follow on infections. And so there's, so for this graph here, we have an inf infected person infecting one other, infects someone else, and then it leads to many other infections over time. If we could spend a lot of money to just get an intervention at targeting this person, it would have prevented a lot of uh, infections and associated care and treatment costs down the track. I think sometimes with uh, uh, many uh, health co economics assessments are often looking at cohorts of people with a disease uh, and maybe not necessarily always considering uh, the flow on effects in terms of transmission and the, and the carry on where infectious diseases obviously uh, that's required here. So this is why we need to sort of sometimes need quite a complex transmission model to understand the dynamics and get a full picture uh, of the cost effectiveness of an intervention over time. Um, just in terms of a bit of background, it's like, uh, as I've said, uh, there's been quite a few modeling studies done looking at cost effectiveness of PrEP in many um, settings, uh, particularly high income settings, but also elsewhere. Um, and generally, these uh, approaches have a similar approach. Uh, they're focusing on the most at-risk populations, which generally in places like the US and UK is MSM or gay and bisexual men. 
and they focus on sort of the costs to the government or the healthcare sector rather than looking at individual level um, sort of societal uh, costs. And generally, there's an, the, the focus is looking at varying coverage, sort of adherence to use of PrEP and, and which populations might be targeted. And with various, you know, in the past, there's been various assumptions around efficacy and presence of other interventions. And usually this is at the time of the study. So going back uh, to these studies, say five, six years ago, the evidence was quite different to what it is now. Um, but I guess you have to just do what you can at the time and with the evidence and data available at the time. I guess for Australian MSM, I was involved in a study um, in 2014 with Karen Schneider and um, this one, I guess, ended up having a result where it was quite specific about what MSM should be targeted with PrEP and, and which um, uh, and, and how should it be rolled out to be cost effective and it was really quite focused. Um, but I think that was at the early stages of the evidence for PrEP's efficacy and, and things like that. So it was really suggested you should just give PrEP to people who are uh, in relationships with a HIV positive partner. Um, I guess uh, going on to sort of the P, uh, next step was uh, in 2016, I, I guess the Australian Federation of AIDS Organisation commissioned the Kirby Institute to assess the cost effectiveness of PrEP uh, at the time. Um, and, and I guess this was, um, I, it was developed to really, uh, I guess the last point there is, a, is the aim of, of this was really to inform advocacy and policymakers and funders and the pharmaceutical in industry and the Therapeutic Goods Association and, and PBAC about trying to get PrEP onto the PBS in, in a sense. Um, and so the idea was to do a cost effectiveness ass assessment to help inform that. Uh, and I guess this work involved many people uh, from the Kirby Institute and other community and clinical and social researchers across UNSW and other institutes and um, other community stakeholders. I guess uh, it was really uh, work based around the guidelines that were first drafted in 2017, the ASH and PrEP guidelines for how uh, who was eligible to receive PrEP if they came into the um, um, came into a doctor and, and wanted to start taking PrEP to prevent or give themselves pre uh, protection from acquiring HIV. Okay, so to do this, um, I, I developed a mathematical model of HIV transmission within, I guess, a categorization of gay men that sort of focused on high, medium and at low risk of infection. Um, and the the way this was done is I actually set up the model for everyone in Australia, uh, but the focus was on gay, uh, gay men. Um, and a model was then calibrated to try and reflect the epidemiological data over 2000 to 2015, and then sort of project forward, um, sort of a status quo, assuming there was no prep uh, in, in place. From, from sort of 2016 or from the end of this period, we're then able to run lots of scenarios to est and then do some analysis and estimate um, cost effectiveness. Uh, when compared, so I guess with cost effectiveness, it's always about a comparison. Is something cost effectiveness compared to something else? And it's so this was just a status quo where there was no prep in place. Uh, and like those other studies I mentioned, this, um, these scenarios sort of varied coverage, the time to reach that coverage, so scale up time, uh, you know, what um, changes in condom use might have occurred, uh, occurred due to PrEP being in place uh, and adherence to PrEP. So was it daily use or did, um, was it a little bit less um, adherent than that? In terms of costings, I guess this was actually informed very much around the PBAC uh, guidelines. And I think we had some um, engagement with PBAC to clarify sort of the type of uh, costings and types of analysis uh, they would require when considering uh, putting PrEP onto, P onto the PBS. Uh, and so I guess this is all informed form by that, but the focus in terms of perspective, it was a, it was a national healthcare sector perspective. So sort of a cost to the Australian government um, focus. Uh, and um, I guess it included all of the aspects around the care and treatment of HIV positive people including their, their drug costs and routine medical and laboratory testing and hospitalization. Uh, and these primarily came from MBS and PBS uh, 
data uh, sources, um, uh, and they were in the, you know sort of the 2015 costs at the at the time. And then for prep, we actually started using the because we didn't really have any prep costs per se, but we just used the drug costs um, from the PBS, which if those drugs were used as treatment, they have a particular cost. And so that's what we assume for PrEP. So in terms of the analyses, um, the timeline a PBAC order is actually sort of a relatively short time time, 2016 to 2030. And they didn't want us to actually go to a lifetime um, time horizon, though I did do the analysis for a lifetime horizon. Um, and then the benefits were measured in the quality, what's called a quality adjusted life years. And often for HIV, um, cost effectiveness analysis often dallies are used, so disability adjusted life years, but uh, I guess PBAC prefer qualies for comparisons to other diseases or infections. Uh, and I guess the analysis applied a 5% discount rate, which is actually a little bit higher than I think usually around 3% is standard, but that's kind of a following the, the guidelines. Uh, and, and essentially, I guess we ran lots of scenarios and calculated uh, incremental cost effectiveness ratios. So we compared it to a status quo, no prep scenario and, and looked at, you know, what was the additional cost or incremental cost per uh, quality gained. Um, and, and then compared that to various uh, thresholds for willingness to pay. Uh, and PBAC actually do not have a stated willingness to pay a threshold for where things would be considered cost effectiveness. Uh, and so uh, we actually looked at what would it prep unit cost be, be or what would it, should it be uh, for the scenario to be uh, cost saving or to be less, to have an ISA that's less than uh, various thresholds uh, shown there. Okay, so I'm just going to give a few slides uh, of results um, and I'm not going to go through lots of results. Obviously, I ran many, many scenarios and looked at many different aspects, but I guess I'll just show a couple of things. So firstly, uh, these results here are sort of showing you two levels of coverage amongst high-risk gay men, or what's considered high-risk gay men, and it's looking at the effectiveness of introducing PrEP uh, with a high coverage. Uh, and you can see, I guess, firstly, with the high coverage, you get a big change in the number of new infections uh, from 2016 uh, to or 2030 and beyond, uh, compared to what a status quo scenario would be without PrEP. Uh, and I guess this, these slides here show you what would happen if there was any sort of reductions in condom use due to PrEP being in, within the population or being in place. Uh, I guess the point with these two figures here is that with the high coverage scenario, it really doesn't matter because the efficacy of PrEP is so high. Um, if if uh, the people who are eligible for PrEP have high coverage, then that counteracts any reduction in condom use. I guess the issues occur when you have low coverage, but the population become less concerned about HIV and there's a lower population-wide uh, level of condom use. And so there can be a risk of having a I guess a negative impact, so to speak. So things become worse, but um, with the low coverage, if, if coverage stays, stays is low. Okay. Um, in terms of the cost effectiveness analysis, we really only have one slide here and it's a little bit complicated. I'll try and go through it, but this is the sort of analysis where we looked at the unit cost for PrEP uh, to be considered cost effective over this time horizon uh, for different thresholds. So I guess um, this is saying, what uh, would the ISA have to be uh, to be, uh, sorry, what would the PrEP unit cost have to be so that the ISA is less than this threshold? And in each case, this little dashed line shows the original estimate. So it was about $10,000 that's using the um, treatment drug costs. And, but if it was used as PrEP, um, to get to you know less than ten thousand, which I guess is sort of a preventative uh, threshold, which I think PVAC suggested that's a uh, the lower end. Uh, you'd have to get down below five thousand um, uh, dollars for uh, each per annum per person taking prep for it to meet this threshold. Um, as you increase the coverage, that actually has to get the um, 
prep unit cost has to get lower. And, and this is, a, I guess, an effect of scaling up and where you start getting sort of a, a, a saturation effect occurring. And so it actually has to get a little bit, uh, you have to have a bit cheaper to become a bit more cost effective, I guess, uh, compared to the status quo or to, you need to, um, you don't achieve quite as much as the coverage increases. If you, have no, if you don't uh, prioritize to the high risk and you let everyone sort of take prep essentially, uh, then you have to get the costs down quite substantially, uh, sort of with to less than you know one to three thousand um, dollars. And and I guess at the end of the day, uh, sort of what what happened, um, I guess the main summary of the results is that you know the focus should be on really prioritizing and scaling up prep as rapidly as possible, uh, and trying to achieve a high coverage within the most at risk population. Uh, and if you do that, then you kind of consider that to be the most uh, cost effective way of rolling out PrEP. Um, and I guess what PBAC ended up doing is they actually recommended listing of PrEP on the PBS, uh, focusing on the, I guess, the medium and high risk uh, men um, based on uh, the guidelines um, in December. And then it became available on uh, April 1st, 2018, and not an April Fool joke. Um, Okay, so I guess the last bit of my uh, last few slides, I want to think about what has happened since 2016. So I guess when I did that analysis about five years ago, things have changed quite a lot uh, in the prep uh, field and in the, with the prep rollout. And so um, I was just gonna try and update uh, my results somewhat. So what has happened since 2016? So now this is a figure uh, from the Sydney game uh, community periodic survey. It's a figure I always misinterpret and always mangle whenever I try and explain it. And I, uh, but I'll do my best. Uh, but this figure here is, I guess it's a prevention coverage figure of gay men who had casual sex in the last six months. And it doesn't depend on their HIV status. So it's sort of all, all gay men, whether they're HIV positive or not, who had casual sex in the last six months. And this yellow bar here is those who, um, met that criteria, uh, uh, HIV negative and uh, engaged in condomless sex, but were on PrEP. So you guess you could say they're protected by PrEP in a way. Um, and as you can see from um, about 2016 or 2015, 2016, when PrEP implementation studies started, uh, there was real growth, I guess, in the use of PrEP, I guess, as an interpretation here um, as a prevention strategy um, up to about 37% here, though that's debatable if that uh, probably not quite uh, population coverage. Um, there's also, be, uh, this is also another figure on a PrEP cascade um, produced uh, by Martin Holt and Leeming Mao uh, from the Center for Social Research and Health. This is from, goes up to 2019. It's from the Trends and Behavior Report. Uh, and it's looking at, I guess, data from the gay and uh, community, gay community, community periodic surveys, looking at the percentage of those surveyed who are eligible, eligible and aware, and then sort of using PrEP um, based on the original criteria. Uh, and so you can see actually the number eligible has increased uh, over time, and that's primarily because of some reductions in condom use and I guess engagement at behaviors that would might be considered or previously considered at risk, maybe not anymore if PrEP's being used. Uh, and I guess you can see this growth in PrEP use among those who are eligible, quite, quite rapid uh, growth, uh, up to about 21% overall, but this is about 60% or so of uh, those who you would consider eligible. And I guess in the model, translating that, you might consider those to be the high risk uh, population, though that's again, a bit of um, interpretation. So how's the model performed first up? Well, assumptions, and as I say, this is, these are a bit rough and ready. Um, I guess translating the uh, rainbow uh, plot uh, and the prep cascade into my model, which is just really crudely separating gay men into high, medium and low risk. Um, can be a bit tricky, but for the purposes of my talk today, I, I made some rough assumptions uh, where I said prep coverage overall is about 37%, uh, with 60% of those that 
sort of in the high risk group uh, being covered by PrEP. So this means there is some PrEP use in the low risk um, where who are, you might say are not, in, not in eligible, but um, that's a little bit hard to sort of make that distinction. Um, and then the other assumption here is that a 50% reduction in condom use. So this is looking at, I guess, the proportion who use, consi uh, use consistent condom condoms use as a protection strategy and just the level of condomless anal intercourse has changed quite a lot with the PrEP rollout. And so here, this is showing the sort of end of 2015 is the dashed line. And so this is the model. Uh, diagnoses in blue and in new infections in red compared to sort of notifications data up to 2018. 2019 is, uh, 2020 number here is just a trend number. It's not the real number. I can't show you that just yet, but I do know it's actually a little bit lower here, due, uh, probably due to COVID. Uh, so COVID may have made this a bit closer to my line, but I think overall the model didn't do a too bad a job. Uh, but we'll have to see what happens in the next uh, couple of years. But I think it's done a pretty good job of fitting, of matching what we've seen since uh, sort of the start of 2016. What's happened with costs? And this is actually quite interesting. So when PrEP was first listed on the PBS, the unit cost, when you sort of tallied up the drugs and the monitoring costs uh, for daily use for a year, was about $3,600. Um, which was around the sort of cost effectiveness uh, threshold, I said, for 75% of high and medium risk men uh, to be, um, so, so uh, high, high medium risk uh, men to be taking PrEP. Uh, if the unit cost was around this amount, then you could sort of consider it'll be uh, cost effective based on the thresholds I showed you before. But now it's actually reduced quite a lot. It's actually, when you do the estimates, it's now around $1,464. Uh, and if you go to the PBS, you'll see the dispense price for a maximum quantity at around 30 tablets is 60 to $70, where before it was about $250. Uh, $250. Um, the other aspect is that HIV treatment costs have fallen substantially, but not as much uh, as the PrEP costs, drug costs. Um, so this could change things quite a lot. And just throwing these numbers into the uh, the model and rerunning it uh, from uh, from uh, 2016 again, uh, you can sort of update the um, costs per qual again, so the ICES. Uh, though I would have make a little <coughs> note that the HIV treatment costs, I didn't update the HIV treatment costs. I didn't quite have time to go through all the procedure of updating them appropriately, but it seems like Obviously, you'd expect with those reductions in costs that PrEP becomes way more cost effective. And even if we do have quite a few uh, lower risk people taking PrEP, where you might not think uh, that's of as much benefit, it still means that you can get um, a very low uh, ISAS to be well below what you consider, a, you know, sort of the various cost effective thresholds to be and almost to be cost saving. I guess at the original cost, uh, if you have uh, a, a fair proportion, uh, I would say a minority, but a reasonable number of low risk taking PrEP, it might not be considered cost effectiveness, but I feel like that's uh, over this time period, though I feel like that some caution there with my assumptions that I used in the model. So I don't, but I think it's fairly clear if we took lifetime costs, which is then sort of looking at well, the costs well beyond 2030, you would end up, these end up becoming cost saving. So at the current prices and costs, uh, it, it looks like uh, PrEP is highly cost effective compared to a no PrEP scenario. A couple of more slides just to finish. Um, so uh, models missing some key uh, variations and gaps um, and it doesn't capture all the dynamics. And I can see Virginia's popping up, so I must be out of, well out of overtime. Um, uh, and as I said, there was a bit of crudeness in how we try and allocate eligible versus non-eligible people to, into the model. Uh, and there's a few aspects around how PrEP use, stopping and starting is not being linked to condom use within, within those people who stop and start it. Um, and there's some costs missing, um, but I guess my main conclusions are, I think my initial model projections have held up pretty well. PrEP's role, it's likely to be highly cost-effective and close to cost-saving at the moment. 
uh, which maybe means we can have a more generous eligibility criteria. And that's it from me. And I just, just some acknowledgements of everyone who helped over the many years this was done. Wow, thank you very much, Richard. It's, it's uh, taking us through um, a lot of work there. And it was really nice to see the link there then to policy recommendations with the PBOC. So thank you very much. You have got a few questions, but what I'm going to suggest is given the, the time constraints that you maybe um, try and type a few answers yep. so everyone can see. And then if there's any sort of curly ones or ones that we want to expand or discuss, we can do that at the very end as well if we've got time. No worries. Um, Thank you very much. All right. Well, um, I'm going to now move on to our next uh, speaker, oh, speakers. Um, and I, I wanted to also emphasize that a lot of the people presenting as part of this series are members of the Health Economics Research Network at UNSW. Um, and that, that network consists of about 28 um, health economists and modelers uh, across the medical faculty and also um, the business school as well. So if you ever want to have a chat with health economists, you can get in touch with us at, at the HERN network, myself and Caroline Watts um, coordinate that. So now back to our next speaker, Ye Zhang. Um, Ye is a Cientia PhD student in um, the CERT program. Uh, the Surveillance and Evaluation Research Program at the Kirby Institute. Um, and she is presenting on some work today that she's done um, with a number of us, but particularly with um, Dr. Jason Ong. Um, Jason is um, also uh, here today. He's a sexual health physician at the Melbourne Sexual Health Centre. Uh, he's also got appointments at Monash University and London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine. Um, and he is also a health economist as well as a um, sexual health physician. And um, Ye, I believe, is going to be the one delivering the presentation today. Um, and it's great that we have some PhD students like yourself who have agreed to be part of the series. So thank you, Ye. Over to you. Thanks for having me to join the Celebrating Health Economics webinar. And today I'm going to present a working paper that um, I'm mentored by Jason Ong and all my supervisors. And this study is using the discrete choice experiment data to explore the preference for HIV testing services and the self-testing distribution among migrant men in Australia. To begin with some background, an international migrant defined as someone who changes his or her country of euro residence, including long-term and um, short-term migrants, uh, irrespective of reasons uh, for migration or legal status. In Australia, the migration has increased significantly over the last 70 years. And in 2020, there were around uh, about 30% of people living in Australia were born overseas. And um, also you can see from the uh, graph at the red corner, the uh, surveillance data have suggested HIV epidemiology in Australia has changed. The HIV notification are decreasing among Australia born gay and bisexual men, while the notification among men born in overseas has increased about 65% between 2009 and 2018. And uh, the graph at the left corner are from um, a recent published uh, paper of Preto and Philip, which shows that the migrants uh, MSM living with HIV are more likely to be undiagnostic or diagnosed late, about three times higher compared to Australian born men. Within the migrants, the people have different access to healthcare. And in Australia, the citizens and the permanent uh, residents have uh, subsidized the general health care access through the National Health Insurance Scheme, which is Medicare. And the migrant who hold the temporary uh, visa from countries with um, a reciprocal health care agreement with Australia are eligible for Medicare as well, which is RHCA. And these countries uh, include New Zealand, UK, and the nine European countries. Well, the temporary immigration from the countries are not eligible for RCA are not able to access Medicare. And the majority of migrants from this group are from Asia and Africa. In terms of HIV testing, the migrants who are eligible for RHCA are, can have the free access to HIV testing, just like 
the other Australian citizens, while the migrants who are not eligible for RHCA need to pay full price for HIV testing at clinics and hospitals, although some may access to free HIV care and treatment through um, compassionate access pub, uh, public and sexual health service and the community sites um, in big cities, or pay full price first and then make a claim through the private insurance. A recent modeling study by the um, Tavari estimated that migrants had lower HIV diagnosis compared with Australian men. And in addition, the migrants from countries not eligible for RHCA had a lower HIV diagnosis compared with those eligible. In addition, the previous studies reported a range of the barrier uh, the migrants GBMSM faced in accessing HIV testing Australia in Australia. The first, they tend to have a lower perceived HIV risk. The migrants uh, report HIV-related materials are not visible in their community, and they got a lack of information about HIV and its testing. The second, some studies found migrants may have a lower level engagement with local health services, which mainly due to their language barrier to access health care and a lack of knowledge of available service in Australia. In addition, the cultural barriers reported as a key barrier as well. The stigma of HIV and the homosexual prominent in overseas foreign men's first country have affected they um, have effect on their trust toward a healthcare system. And at last, coming to settling in your country is a, no, a direct process. Uh, they usually isolate and absent from social and family support, involving a high level of stress, and some of, some of them may have financial constraints, makes them more anxiety about being HIV positive and preferred not to find out their HIV status. So how to promote HIV testing among migrants? The HIV subtesting is an innovative tool to decentralize the HIV testing that allow people collect their own test specimen, performing the test and interpreting the result by themselves. It has been introduced as an effective tool with the potential for increasing testing uh, frequency and the promoting early diagnosis among high-risk population. And also during the COVID-19, we can see it showed uh, a promising result to reach the hard-to-reach population as well. It is worth to find out if the self-testing will be a suitable tool for migrants to promote their HIV testing. Uh, as a response to the new epi data, improving the HIV testing rate among Australian migrants has been newly added as one of targets in the HIV strategy in New South Wales between 2021 and 2025. And to achieve this new target, it is important to improve our understanding of migrant preference for HIV testing service and self-testing. And it will help shape the service design, address the need of them. So in this study, we compared the, the preference of HIV testing services and self-testing distribution among um, uh, MSM born in Australia and uh, the men born in RHCA eligible group and R, uh, the men born in RHCA ineligible countries through the discrete choice experiments. And uh, what is discrete choice experiment? Um, in the discrete trust experiment, it asks the uh, respondents to complete a choices based form of stated preference um, elicitation. It has been widely used in public health and uh, to design the patient centered care service. And in the past, we have been started to use the DCE to assist in development of safe and effective HIV technology policies and provide a decision basis for medical staff to make a treatment plans. On the right is an example of unlabeled DCE survey, which is just published in Pulse Medicine. And in the DCE, the participants are asked to choose the preferred generally between uh, two to five alternatives. And in the example here, they designed a two unlabeled alternatives, uh, option A and option B. The reason we call it up, um, unlabeled is because we cannot tell what's the difference between option A and B unless we look 
into details what attribute it includes. And each choice task consisted of several attributes that may influence the people's choice. Uh, each re respondent will choice over a number of choice tasks like this. And this is built on the idea that even if people cannot provide a measure of value, they can usually indicate which scenario they prefer. So in this study, we designed a two DCE surveys. The first is the DCE test survey to investigate MSM preference for different aspects of HIV testing, including the self-testing. And the DCE kit survey is invest, uh, investigated preference, preference for different aspects of HIV self-testing and AIDS delivery. Uh, the study was designed by Dr. Jason Ong and followed a series of steps showing in flow diagram on the right. First, a scoping literature review and qualitative interviews were performed to identify the potential attributes of HIV testing and self-testing delivery that might influence uh, the mass likelihood to test. And based on the funding, there are about six uh, attributes were chosen mm -hmm. for DCE test survey, uh, and four attributes were chosen for DCE kit survey. Uh, sorry. So uh, also we choose the unlabeled DCE experiment with two alternative alternatives after the pilot study and adjustment, and the 16 trials were uh, designed for each survey. So this table showed all attributes and its levels in the DCE test survey. And these attributes included the cost of test, the length of time to receive the result, the window period, which means the length of time you need to wait to detect the antibody, and the mode of test, the accuracy uh, of the test, and who was responsible for collecting the specimen. Each attribute includes three to four levels. And uh, in this table, it showed like the four attributes for the DCE kit survey and uh, including the cost of self-testing kit and where to obtain the kit, the packaging of the kit and information on how to use the kit. So uh, recruitment and the study population. In this study, the participants were recruited using online and offline method. And uh, in total, 1,606 men uh, were enrolled in December 2017 and January 2018. Uh, and, and overall, we included 1,023 men in the Australian group. And among the migrants, 164 were born in RHCA eligible group, and 419 were born in RHCA ineligible group. And besides the choice side, we also collect the participants' social demographic information like age, country of birth, and the duration of stay in Australia, as well as their sexual history characteristics and HIV testing history. So this table shows the characteristics of all, all participants completing the DCE test survey and the DCE kit survey compared with three groups. And uh, I will not spend too much time in this table today, but uh, just to let you know overall, the majority of men had been tested for HIV in the past, and about 10% of men had ever used self-testing, and 20% reported they were delayed HIV testing because no HIV self-testing are available. Then I would like to talk about some results of this study. The first, we compare the relative importance of each attribute in two surveys. The yellow column represents the Australian born group. The purple column represents the RHCA eligible group. And the blue column represents the RHCA ineligible group. Um, on the left graph, we can see that the cost was the highest column for the blue group, which means RHCA ineligible group were most influenced by the cost of HIV test. While in Australian born and RHCA eligible group, the attribute with the highest relative importance weighs the fifth column, the accuracy of the test. And the other attributes were have the similar relative importance among three groups. 
the mode of test decade and the specimen collector were less important compared to other attributes. And on the right graph, we can see that when considering the HIV subtesting, the relative importance of attributes were generally similar between groups and the cost were mostly important attribute for all group followed by the location where the kid were delivery and the type of packaging, the type of instruction to use the test were lesser important attribute. And the next figure is we use the three mixed logic models to compare the preference of HIV testing service among three groups. The higher utility means higher preference here. So we found that the preference actually generally is the same between groups. The participants usually, uh, generally prefer a free um, or low cost oral test with a higher accuracy and a shorter window period. And look at the last attribute on the right. The respondents across the three groups preferred subtesting over testing by house worker or by their peers. Then we found some significant uh, figure generality across the group preference for HIV subtesting distribution. The first, they all preferred a free or low cost subtesting. And the second comparison is the location of delivering subtesting. So Australian born group and RHCA eligible group, which is yellow and purple, most preferred accessing Kate through online distributor, while the RHCA eligible group most preferred Kate from a pharmacy. And we can see at the end of this line, all groups least preferred accessing Kate from sex venue. So in this slide, it's the latent class analysis models uh, result and the only conducted with respondents from RHC AE eligible group to further understand their heterogeneous uh, preference for HIV testing service. And giving small number of respondents born in RHC AE eligible group, and we have no able to do this analysis among them. So you can see there are four classes of participants were identified in the DCE test survey. And in each class, there are attributes are showing that significantly influence their use of HIV testing surveys. The attribute is presenting by the order of importance. So for example, the class one, there are 33, uh, 23% of participants from um, RHCA in eligible group belong to uh, class one. And uh, this group mostly influenced by the accuracy of the test. And in class two, 24% of participants belong into this class and were mostly influenced by the cost of test and tend, tend to be aged above 25 years older or born in Southeast Asian region. Uh, in the third class, 25% uh, of participants belong to this class were strongly influenced by who collect the specimen and they prefer the testing by themselves and were more likely to be aged more than 25 years old. And at last, the class four were most sensitive towards testing window period, and, but they also preferred testing by themselves. So this result is from the latent class analysis for DCE Kate survey shows that 48% uh, participants belong to class one and uh, it's strongly influenced by the cost and of the self-testing kit. They least prefer a test kit with a small plain package with a, a bit wear, and, but had no significant preference for where to access the test. And the men who had never tested before were more likely to belong to this class. In the second class, it's 22% uh, of people in, belong to this class, and they also mostly influenced by the cost of test kit, but they also show influenced by the location of accessing self-testing and the preferred the kit purchased uh, in the shelf uh, from the pharmacy and the least preferred accessing kit from the sex venue. So uh, the, one of the strong 
of our analysis is that we have a larger sample size. The performance data from this underserved population is quite limited, and mainly due to the small sample size of previous disease studies. So this study include about 1,600 men and around 600 war migrants provide a great opportunity for us to do this analysis. And also uh, in this study, we covered a range of HIV testing and HIV self-testing attributes. One of the limitations for this analysis is that all of the survey is conducted in English, so we didn't include the non-English speaking migrants. So uh, in this study, we found First, the free or low cost HIV testing was a strong performance for all men, but HIV testing cost was most significant virus for testing for the RHCA ineligible group, but not for the other two groups. And uh, also we found accuracy and window period are also important attribute for all groups, which suggested that the accuracy and free HIV tests remain an uh, important component for HIV testing program. And from the uh, funding, we can see that two group of men from RHCA eligible group are um, about 50% of them are preferred uh, HIV subtesting, but only um, one in 10 of respondents in our study report ever using subtesting. And in addition, uh, a court reported uh, they delayed self -test, uh, HIV testing since subtesting was not available. Uh, to date, in Australia, like um, they only preferred one self testing kit that uh, consumer can order online or through the uh, health organizations. But both scenario require some time waiting time to get the self testing kit, and in addition, only finger prick test available, but oral test is a preferable choice. And overall, our funding indicates that access could be expanded if the tests were free or available in more location, and further implementation are needed to understand the cultural context of migrants MSM, identity, identify and uh, respond to their specific needs and a better tailored assistant uh, Subtesting intervention for this group. At last, uh, the ACON has been working very hard to design um, and build uh, similar responses to better engage the ways uh, overseas foreign gay and bisexual men, including launch uh, Chinese clinics. And thanks to all people for helping me to do this uh, study. Thanks. Thank you. Yay. A very nice presentation. Well done. And um... I think maybe people not only interested in the empirical results, but also um, thinking perhaps about how uh, discrete choice experiments might be something that they could incorporate in their research. So thank you very much. We've just got a few minutes left and I'm going to be a bit selective here. I can see that Richard's been very busy um, responding to some of the earlier questions. Um, and just maybe to um, summarize a couple, there's a comment here from Andrew Grulick. Thanks for presentation. There's a powerful data which make the case for a much larger scale prep rollout than is currently the case in countries with predominantly MSM epidemics. Um, and uh, Richard, I wonder if I could just bring you back to one other question and then we'll move to Ye as well. Um, this um, anonymous comment, uh, would this sort of analysis apply to non-Australian settings, particularly LMIC, low and middle income countries, or do many of the assumptions change for it to be more broadly applicable? Um, what were your thoughts on that? Um, yeah, thanks. Thanks, Virginia. So I, I did put a quick response uh, to those questions, but I guess generally, uh, thanks, Andrew, I suppose, firstly. Uh, I think I noted to him, though, that I assume he was talking about probably my new updated results um, with the change in costs. And I guess that needs to be solidified, I would say, <laughs> somewhat, uh, just to make sure it's fit, uh, robust. Um, so I'll probably be chatting to Andrew and you, Virginia, to make sure I do the health economics projections appropriately, given changes in costs and things like that. Um, in terms of translation, I think, you know, the results sort of of the impact of you know, pretty much robust in terms of translating to other settings, so other high income settings, but obviously costs 
uh, and sort of just how things are implemented do vary quite a lot from setting to setting. So the cost effectiveness side of things and the health economics is probably very setting specific. And in particular for low and middle income countries, I think you would have to redo the analyses. Just, and some people have done that, have been looked at prep in low and middle income countries, but it's, yeah, the assumptions and the parameters and how it would be rolled out are very setting specific, I think. Thank you, Richard. Thanks a lot. Thanks for those questions as well. Um, just a couple of um, ones I wanted to direct to, to Yay. First one's a comment from um, Philip Keane, um, congratulating you on the presentation. Makes a strong case for self um, making self-test free, although this would require a government subsidy. Hopefully state governments can fund in the absence of Medicare MSAC funding. Um, thanks, Philip. Um, and also Caroline here. Um, yay. Caroline says, um, it seemed like most men in all um, RHCA eligible and ineligible groups had university degrees. How well do you think your population is generalizable to overseas born men? Do you have any thoughts on that? Uh, yeah, that's, um, the funding shows that the overseas born men have a higher education level compared to the Australian born men in our um, uh, respondents. And uh, it may affect by like the, our uh, survey are um, recruit from the football and grinder and as well as to largest the uh, um, sexual health clinics in Sydney and Melbourne. So we may miss the some um, migrants who are not go to the clinic or not very engaged in the social uh, platforms. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Great. Um, and I'm going to just slip a very quick one in because we're just out of time. Um, yay. For uh, discrete choice experiments, the, the data collection theme is often fairly straightforward. It's really the questionnaire design. I, my understanding, you know, the fractional uh, factorial design is can be quite complex and can sometimes put people off a little bit if they don't have access to people to support or advise on that. What's your experience been? Have you have you found that you have have you done training in that? How have you managed? Uh, because it's not that easy to pick up quickly. Yeah, I, I haven't got the opportunity to do that. Uh, Jason do all of the work and he's the expert in the DCE design. But I just attended a short course of the DCE course. Actually, it's you and Jason recommended to me. It's called, um, so you can, uh, it's in the University of Sydney. And it, uh, this year it's just finished, but it's quite interesting and interactive course. And it gave the, all of the information you need for design or DCE study and also uh, taught you how to analyze mm -hmm. the data for a disease study as well, highly recommended. Yeah. Great, right. there seems to be two ways. You can either do the, um, have someone do the analysis and support that, or you can um, uh, pick up those skills as well. Thank you very much, Ye. Thanks everybody. Can I um, thank Richard and Ye once more? Um, great presentations and thanks for uh, excellent engagement. Lots of people attending. I hope we got through your questions. And look out for the next health economics and health systems um, seminar. Thanks, everybody.